welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. I'm your host, Jimmy Smith. And thanks for stopping by. This is a channel dedicated to wine education. And this is focusing at the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, the WSET. So this is going to be a presentation on the level four. So this is wine production, otherwise known as D1 or Unit 1. And this is on vineyard establishment. So we'll go through a bit of an introduction in a second. Um, as always, uh, if you are watching this via YouTube, you can click on the subscribe button as I post two updates a week on, uh, on YouTube. But I also have a wonderful online resource, which is called my e-learning portal at www.winewithjimmy.com. Information can also be found in the description below this video. We have many, many more videos uh, on the e-learning portal, plus things like flashcards, revision sessions, short written answer questions, multiple choice questions, and all of those things spread out across the WSET syllabuses. Please do check it out. It will help you immensely for your wine studies. If you do have any comments and questions and you'd like to get in touch via social media, you can. All that is found at the bottom of every slide. Or you can comment on this video on YouTube or get in touch direct at the website www.winewithjimmy.com. Okay, so let's start to look at vineyard establishment. This is the first in a multi-part series on vineyard establishment. This video will be available free on YouTube and everything else in the series will only be available on the Wine with Jimmy e-learning portal. You know where to go to check it out. So talking about the foundation steps in citing a vineyard, establishing a vineyard. It's a very in-depth process, um, as is really landscaping and designing things out in the wild is. And we have lots of steps to follow because getting it right at this stage means that you will have less problems when the vineyard is established, of course. So very, very important steps here. And we're going to have a look, just a quick look at the overview of this whole series called Vineyard Establishment. We're going to go through on this section an introduction, uh, just a quick introduction about what we mean about vineyard establishment. And then we're going to look at the concepts of terroir, what it means and um, the problems with it, the positives of it and all those kind of things. So that's going to be in this presentation. Soil preparation, planting materials and discussing vine age will all come in videos after this video available on my e-learning portal. OK, so let's get rocking and rolling then. So we're going to begin with an introduction. Let's have a look at that. So here you are. So many of the decisions that are made and processes carried out, like I mentioned earlier, during this quite uh, tricky time, really are important. Uh, because if you have a lack of planning or there are some compromises that are made, potentially something like financial compromises or uh, potentially some shortcuts, then this could mean that there are issues with the vineyard later on down the line. And it could have uh, implications, of course, for quality of fruit that you extract from that vineyard. So we have a number of importance of planning, which I have listed on the right hand side there. So things like site selection, the ideal location. So bringing into place, of course, things like aspect, bringing things into place like the slope and the gradient, um, but also many other things such as um, locality, labor force uh, and all of those things. So site selection is very important. Geology and the preparation of the soil is quite important, of course, as well. We need that soil uh, in order to sustain the life of the plant. And also we need things to be in balance with that soil, things to do with its pH levels, its nutrients, the amount of water availability, talking about things like conductivity, heat, and so on. All of those things need to be thought of in the locality, the climate that you are in. So soil preparation is mightily important as well. And we're gonna go through that, of course, 
in a, another presentation in great detail. The planting materials, okay, so the type of rootstocks that we have, the type of clones that we are using, and all of those, where we get them from, um, the nurseries we use, and so on. Uh, also things like nutrient management as well, water management, if we do indeed need to manage these key things. Nutrient management may be done through composting and fertilizer use. Water management, of course, things like um, drip irrigation, which may, ne may be needed in places that drain very, very freely. And of course, later on down the line with canopy management, potentially, of course, you are planting vines, which are maybe pergolas, for instance, very tall vines where they need to have pillars. They need to have um, real good supports to create those very tall types of pergolas, be it a pergola trentina or a pergola veronese, you know, the different types we have in somewhere like Italy, for example. So a detailed site assessment should be carried out at this point to determine the suitability of the land and decide, of course, then the steps that need to be taken to prepare that land for the forthcoming plantation of the vineyard. And really, you do need a strategy. You really need to think about taking data from that landscape. Um, of course, taking things like pH levels, um, taking soil samples, drainage samples, all those things need to be considered. And then, of course, if anything needs to be tweaked, then you would do that, of course, um, with the consulting that you have on board. OK, so that's a very important step in those early, uh, early stages. OK, so let's talk about terroir. So that's the introduction to this section. We're going to talk about terroir and then on future videos we'll get into a lot of depth around things like site selection, soil preparation and so on. So terroir, first of all, something which of course many of you may have some understanding of, but in fact it is a topic which is quite commonly misunderstood. So terroir comes from the French, the French terre, which means land. Uh, so therefore, we are talking around something to do with the landscape, uh, so terroir, and it's used in discussion much about wine and also in the marketing of wine. Terroir is often brought up, um, often just to denote the land or the soil, which is not necessarily correct, as this little diagram shows you. It does mean the terrain, it does mean the geology, but it also means the localised climate and weather patterns and also then the human influence. Some people will uh, create the human influence within terroir as well, so the tradition, and I'll go through that uh, as well. There is not a, a precise and agreed definition of terroir and common issues is the misinterpretation of it or the misuse of it and defining on what it means. Um, so we'll go through those uh, in, uh, in, just, uh, in just a second. Okay, so terroir, terroir, and really to be honest, it's one word in French and an essay in English. It really is uh, uh, quite difficult to put pen to paper when describing terroir. Okay, but we're gonna have a go at it. So, first of all, terroir in the meaning that it has a sense of place. It's able to relate to a place and therefore this is giving it some kind of physical definition, an actual physical definition. So, a wine can show characteristics that relate to specific and particular places. Uh, so, of course, things like climate, soil, aspect, elevation, altitude, those kind of things. So famously, wines that are made in the Côte d'Or, for instance, so the golden slopes of Burgundy, from only sort of 100 meters apart, and you know, this plot next to this plot, um, can actually produce fundamentally different styles of Chardonnay and very much Pinot Noir, depending on those things. Now, the climate generally is gonna be quite consistent, but the geology can change uh, as there are slopes there in the Côte d'Or and you have those different layers of slopes which have been exposed. So therefore you have different 
um, geological epochs, uh, stratas of soils. Some will be limestoney marls, Kimmeridian, Portlandian. Some will be um, more kind of clay based and alluvial. And you have all of that diversity. You also, of course, you don't have all slopes facing exactly the same way. They follow the land and the erosion of the land and fault lines. So there are different aspects, of course. And that means that we have slopes facing different directions, meaning that that certain place can be a little bit different in terms of producing a slightly more riper wine or a less ripe wine. And that really gives it a sense of place as well. Um, but also other things as well. So things like um, drainage um, and uh, all of those. So this is the physical definition. And I, I've, I've given you a picture here, which is a quite detailed map of the Corton Hill, which is within the Cote d'Or. It's in the northern part of the Cote de Bone, right on the border of the Cote de Nuit. So if you were to go to the left of this picture, you are going down towards Bone and villages such as uh, savigny le bone places like Volnay, Pomar, etc. Go to the right of this map, which is more to the north, northeast. And this is where we're heading up towards the Côte de Nuit and Nuit Saint-Georges, for instance. And here is this big white part here. This is the hill of Corton, which has the forest on the top of it. And here you've got all of that dark red area is Grand Cru vineyards, um, stretching really from around sort of uh, Charlemagne, Corton Charlemagne, and then things like Corton, the mixture of Cortons that we have and lots of different names of those. And of course, you'll see here, you've got some that face south, some at the base of the slope, some at the middle, some at the top. And they are fundamental differences between those due to them actually lying on different geology. Um, so you often find that the wines um, are a little bit more nervy and fresh when they're towards the top of the slope compared to a bit more round and voluptuous at the bottom of the slope, generalizing. But it gives you a sense of idea of the place. And many of the great Grand Cru's sort of sit in the middle part of the of the slope, of course. So that is uh, a sense of place, terroir as a sense of place, but that is only one aspect of terroir. Sorry about aspect, I'm using the, the pun there in that sense. Um, one that it's very commonly linked to is, of course, geology. Uh, so I've actually mentioned that a little bit on the last slide, because when you've got things like aspect uh, in that area, you're going to have some changes in geology. These can be quite minor, where you could have slightly more iron in one vineyard and slightly more rocks in the next. And, but that will give a different sense of wine. And, it, and it's the terroir. It's a part of its terroir. It's land. So um, that is quite important as well. So this tends to be a little bit manipulated. Uh, and of course, this is where we start to get people talking explicitly about how the terroir directly affects the wine, how it really can shape flavours and aromas directly. It's more indirect than that. Let me describe that a bit more. So you will find that many, um, many people will market wines, maybe retailers and so on, by talking that the um, perceived chalkiness of a soil, for example, in Chardonnay is due to the vines being grown on chalky soils. They're, they're therefore telling you they are explaining that it is the, the chalk in the soil, so our calcium carbonate, which is creating a chalky taste in the wine. Um, so that is a soil linked to an aroma or flavor, which is not possible. Now, geologists will, of course, very much contest this because in its form, these soils, these chalks and these rocks, and maybe it's granite or schist or whatever, are odorless and flavorless. Uh, the majority of rocks, and we're talking an overwhelming majority. So therefore, if they are odorless, then what kind of flavors and characters are we getting? It's an interesting point to make. Also, the um, the nutrients uh, and these, these minerals, these stones and rocks are not able to be taken up by the vine. Nutrients are, but not necessarily the rocks or the minerals. So the fact that they are once again found within the wine is another um, point to contest. But what can be mentioned is that, of course, soil has different characteristics in terms of, of course, drainage capability, um, different types of minerals and rocks, um, different types of conductivity, uh, and then things like pH levels. 
This can have a, uh, an influence on the wine style. Of course, very high pH soils tend to make very low pH wines. Um, so alkaline soils such as chalk based soils and limestone, you tend to find very, uh, very low pH and very acidic wines. And that acidity is what really tends to craft the saline or salty or what some people will call as mineral characteristic oyster shell like. So there is a link there. Um, I think it's more metaphorical than actual you know, physical link to, between it, but it certainly does shape us and it shapes our descriptors that we've used, of course, for wine education for, for so long now. So the uh, just want to overstress again that the scientific community, geologists, for example, do very strongly contest the, the direct link between geology and wine, of course. And there are good textbooks you can look into this. Uh, Alex Maltman, uh, which is a very good book. Actually, I wonder if I have it here. Yes, I do. There you go. Uh, so this, this book, Alex Maltman, Vineyards, Rocks and Soils, is a very good book to read, certainly if you are wanting to know much more in depth about um, uh, rocks and soils and minerals and how they um, are found in vineyards across the world and what they do and don't do in terms of uh, the styles of wines that we find. Um, the picture you got here then is um, a Shabli example directly. So in Shabli, you have two major types of soils which are discussed within wine, which is Kimmeridium miles and Portlandium miles. The word mile is in a bit an annoying term for a geologist because it doesn't really exist. It's more actually probably mudstone, which is a, a type of rock really, which is in between something like um, limestones and, and, and clays, somewhere in between those. The description that comes before it, Kimmeridian or Portlandian, is really due to the geological epoch, the time when this soil was formed. So, for example, with Kimmeridian Marl, which is the picture on the left-hand side, which is where we find our very famous Grand Cru of uh, Chablis, so the Grand Cru with its seven climat, plus some very famous Premier Cru sites like uh, Monte de, de Tonnerre, for example, which is just down to the south of the Grand Cru slopes. That is the one that tends to make that um, nervousness and intensity that you can find within Chablis. The soil was formed 160 million years ago uh, and um, is the most prized soil. Then you have the Portlandian miles and you've got some fossils there. These were formed 140 to 150 million years ago. So they are a younger geological soil and you tend to get um, more rounded and softer wines that are produced on this. And therefore a lot of generic Chablis and Petit Chablis are found on Portlandian Mars. Very broad differentiation here. There's a lot of overlap and other soils that come into play, but um, it's, it's some way that we describe wine and the link to terroir um, and really it, the, the concept of, of actual flavors is one that can be contested but definitely the wine's texture or roundness or things like that, the acidity levels are what are impacted uh, a lot more um, and that may be detected by humans. Um, and then there is the human influence directly. So some, some um, very key commenters will actually say that uh, human interventions are important also within the concept of terroir. Now, if you ask someone who hasn't really discussed terroir too much or studied it, they may have a loose definition around the earth, the land. Uh, but we've already mentioned that, of course, it can be more than that. The climate, the weather, the aspect, the soils, of course, as well. The vine itself is also very important. And the vine is cultivated by us, by humans. So what we do to the vine and how we craft it is also considered by some as a concept of terroir as well. Uh, and this is actually further um, seen and it's further ratified in the French system, for example. Within the French system of PDO, the protected designation of origin, so that's things like the Appellation Origine Contrôlée, for example, um, and others around the world, uh, in Europe anyway, you'll see um, with PDOs in France, they actually have regulations on these. So planting densities, the type of trellising that you can use, the yield limits, and the list can go on. Uh, so, of course, 
This also can impact the wine style and could be argued to be a point of terroir as well. This is more of a cultural definition uh, that includes, of course, the physical elements such as the vine itself, but it goes, of course, beyond them. Then um, also just talking a little bit about um, what terroir is there, we've given you some ideas to think about, certainly about its direct links and the sense of place, the link to geology, and then also the human influence. Um, but then there's also understanding how terroir or a sense of place can be overridden by very overzealous winemaking. And what we mean by that is kind of winemaking, extreme winemaking, too much winemaking. Uh, and this can be noted on many, many wines in the world, which have been more manufactured in the winery and you have a less sense of the vineyard and you'll get many grape growers in the world that really care about their grapes and their wines that will tell you the general rule is 90 percent of the wine is made in the vineyard which seems counterintuitive because of course you make wine in a winery but what they mean by that is it's the quality of the grapes that makes the wine and it gives it a sense of place. So what is overzealous winemaking specifically? Well, well, of course, you've got three examples there and there are many others, but things like um, uh, picking overripe fruit or only working with overripe fruit, this increases intensities, uh, this increases flavour intensity often of things like jamminess cooked stewed fruits and even dried fruits in places. Now, the sense of place of where that comes from could be argued that that should be what grapes are like. They should be overripe from those places. But when you bring all the concepts of terroir into play, including having a sense of the locality, the land, the geology, would you be able to taste it? Would you be able to differentiate that from another wine which is made similar to those methods in the world? And that's where it becomes quite difficult. So overripe fruit, um, it takes the taste away from the sense of place, or it can do. Over extraction, meaning, of course, more work in the winery, more uh, remontage and more pigeage, more pumping over and more punching down, more contact with its skins, more higher temperatures. And that over extraction really means you get more colours, potentially more tannins, but more intensity. There could be a loss in wine style and sense of place due to that as well. And once again, you could argue that uh, because it comes from a place that the grapes are remarkably healthy and ripe with their tannins, potentially then the wine should be made in that way. But of course, around the world, very similar climates that have Mediterranean warm climates, you therefore are gonna get very homogenous wines around the world, they taste very similar. And then aging in new oak. Now, I think this is definitely accepted as one that very much obscures terroir and does not in any way add to it. If it is overused and you put a wine in a new oak barrel with too much time in that barrel, the wine is going to taste of the barrel. And I put a picture here of oak chippings that could be posted, of, uh, uh, used, of course, purchased and used, but things like staves as well to gain the taste of oak, which often a lot of people have liked and still do like in wine. Could you taste the wine that's beneath it if it's heavily oaked? Certainly on younger wines that maybe their oak integration hasn't happened yet, then that wine could not be differentiated from any other um, quite heavily oaked wine in the world. And we only have to look at the wine styles where you have heavily toasted um, chips or heavily toasted barrels used, where you start to get the roasted coffee and chocolate characteristics, maybe with some pinotage in South Africa or some chili and Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, just for a couple of examples. If you start to line them all up and taste them at a blind tasting, could you really start to individually taste those 
and say what grape variety they were. Um, if you knew what you were looking for, then maybe, but it would be a challenge for many people because the overriding characteristic would be things like coffee, chocolate, um, roasted, toasty notes. Um, and we've all tasted wines that have had very dominating factors like that. So that could, of course, obscure the terroir, masking the inherent character of that wine style. And then just a little bit, um, uh, a little bit around uh, linking it to a previous presentation on precision viticulture. So while terroir has been strongly associated with the French and then with other classic European wines like the Mosul, the Rheingau, Rioja, etc., winemakers around the world now are now showing an interest in the different expressions of wines made from grapes in single vineyard plots or specific locations and of course anywhere in the world this is taking place they are very proud across the world to tell you about their sense of terroir and place uh, certainly when you start to get quite distinctive differences even within a an area or a town or a city and so on so this is even being further strengthened by the use of soil mapping technology such as precision viticulture which is covered in a separate video um, in the previous series Okay, so that brings me to the conclusion of this first video looking at vineyard establishment. I really hope that you found this useful and you've liked the, um, the annotations, the pictures, and you've followed on quite nicely. Please do get in touch if you want to comment. You can do so via social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. You can do so directly from my e-learning portal. That's at www.winewithjimmy.com. Or you can get in touch, of course, because this video is available as free content on YouTube. You can comment on the YouTube video. Please make sure you click the subscribe button as well. So it's been a pleasure. Next time, please, if you find yourself in the wonderful city of London, you know that I have wine bars and wine schools. So please come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much.